Hello everybody, welcome to part two uh, of this video. It's the first time in a while that I've recorded two parts in one day, and therefore I'm going to be wearing the same outfit as I was in uh, the last part. But um, yeah, I hope that you're excited for this video. Again, I because this is a video I just recorded in one massive block, I've probably cut it at a kind of random arbitrary point, and therefore you should definitely go back and watch part one, because it, it's supposed to be watched as, it was originally recorded as two parts, it's definitely supposed to just be taken as one part. So go and watch part one. Don't expect to really understand everything or get the kind of full experience of the video if you're just watching part two. Um, but with that said, because, you know, it's supposed to be viewed as one part, I won't interrupt the flow too much and I'll just say uh, enjoy. Intriguing about TERFs though is that the majority of the feminism that they engage in mainly seems to work to discredit trans people. Like their feminism doesn't really appear to exist unless it- But here's the thing, like this is, it's kind of the bad to pay fallacy, right? Like you don't notice the feminism uh, unless it's about uh, trans identity because you, like you're just gonna think like, here's the thing, okay? Um, when I like just generally say something generically kind of feminist or aligned with feminism, you're not going to notice that, right? You're just going to think, oh, it's just a person saying a feminist thing. So when I or a radical feminist has said something unambiguously feminist uh, in terms of it, its substance, you would probably just like not really, you know, you wouldn't recognize it as a gender critical person saying this stuff. It's worth noting that a lot of the time, whenever, pretty much whenever I tweet something that's not directly about gender identity, uh, and it does like remotely well in terms of like the number of likes it gets, I will always check um, and consistently, there will be at least one person who has liked the comment, who has pronouns in their bio and doesn't follow me. So if they don't know who I am, all they've seen is this tweet from me and they've said, oh, I like that. So that's the point. The only area where I actually disagree with these people a lot of the time, clearly, is on gender identity. And when I just tweet my actual opinions outside of gender identity, they wouldn't notice it. They wouldn't actually be like, oh, well, this person must clearly be a, um, you know, somebody who disagrees with my gender identity. They're just going to think, oh, yeah, this is just somebody I agree with. And yeah, that's the reality. Now, I will stress, of course, that uh, I'm not necessarily claiming that gender critical feminists talk about like generic feminist issues as much as like other feminists. You know, for example, gender critical feminists, I think don't talk as much about the wage gap maybe as other feminists might, but that's just because gender critical feminists have something else to talk about and something which is very relevant. Of course, gender critical feminists, um, if they, well, yeah, first of all, the very fact they have anything else to talk about means they're gonna talk about the thing at least a little bit. But then when you consider how significant the idea of trans identity is within our current society, it makes sense gender critical feminists are going to talk about it a lot. So I will acknowledge that that seems to be the main focus, but it's also worth noting that a lot of the time, the uh, like talking about trans identity is where gender critical feminists show their feminism. For example, uh, they talk about preserving women's sports that's feminism. They talk about, uh, you know, like abuse shelters for, um, or rather shelters for, for victims of abuse who are women. That's feminism. Uh, you consider how often, for example, I uh, criticize transgender identity for being misogynistic or patriarchal. Those criticisms indicate that I am engaging with feminism when I do that. Uh, the reality is that even while you might say that the feminism uh, is focused on gender identity, it's still dealing with other feminist issues, but just putting them within the context of gender identity. Uh, but of course, I, for my part, uh, actually have videos on this channel, which are, ex you know, admittedly, it's not something I do as much anymore, although it's something which maybe at some point I'd like to return back to, exclusively about women's issues. For example, I have a whole video just on the, uh, the wage gap, and I don't mention gender identity at all, except for one little kind of joke at the end. Um, but the entirety of the main substance of the video is just about the wage gap. There's nothing about gender identity there. But obviously it would be kind of boring for me to just talk about, uh, you know, like generic kind of feminist issues all the time, when that's kind of something which has already been sort of done to death. And by contrast, the gender identity thing is this new significant debate. And I should point out, and this is a really important point to bear in mind, even like people who don't aren't critical of trans identity but will call themselves feminists, aren't really making feminist videos anymore. Like how many just generic feminist videos or feminist YouTube channels are there on YouTube right now? You know, it used to be like back in kind of the heyday of like um, 2013 through to maybe 2016, 2017, when the kind of old like SJW, uh, anti-SJW YouTube thing was around. 
and like BreadTube was just getting started, that a lot of videos were just about like feminism. Obviously, Gamergate was a really big focus there, like a big talk about kind of misogyny, encountering misogyny, and you know, you could just talk about feminism more generically. But the thing is, nowadays, I'm not actually aware of any YouTube channels which are just talking about feminism produced by uh, people who affirm transgender identity. So you're criticizing people who criticize transgender identity, you know, gender critical uh, feminists, for not talking about feminism enough. But meanwhile, on your side, I'm not really seeing anybody just talk about feminism, uh, except for, I guess, maybe you could say, like, uh, every now and then, um, you know, like a kind of ri rich celebrity will stand up and be like, abortion matters, or let's fix the wage gap, which, you know, obviously is, is not nothing. But yeah, ultimately, I'm not actually seeing like substantial feminist discourse coming from either side of the gender identity debate, divorced from the matter of gender identity itself. So yes, gender critical feminists do tend to talk more about gender identity, um, you know, when it comes to their kind of feminist discourse. But uh, that I don't think is particularly unique in the current, you know, kind of climate of feminist discourse where there's not actually that much just sort of generic feminist discourse totally divorced from gender identity going on right now. While I received backlash from many TERFs, I am not super into the idea of platforming a ton of their voices. So instead this brings me to one of the few TERFs I would like to specifically discuss. Me. It's me. It's definitely me. I guarantee it's going to be me. I should stress that I'm aware that like entertaining the idea of me being described as a TERF might cause some objections from people who would say that I'm not, for example, a feminist, uh, or certainly not a radical feminist, um, because I'm a man. Uh, but obviously I can say from experience that uh, uh, gender identity people do call me a TERF. They consider me to be a TERF. Um, and with that said, but obviously I don't really think that I'm going to be the person mentioned here. I assume it's going to be JK Rowling, that would make the most sense, right? Because JK Rowling is the kind of like, has the biggest platform. So yeah, let's just confirm that. Magdalene Burns. Okay. I mean, that seems, I was kind of thinking it could be Magdalene Burns, but I was thinking to myself like, would you really like make a video criticizing somebody who's dead? That just seems kind of gross, right? I mean, like I assume that things are going to be handled kind of like uh, respectfully and, you know, like in kind of good taste. But even still, like making a video kind of epic style debunking this person who is dead um, just seems, I don't know, kind of ghoulish. But okay, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm not saying that you can't criticize the work of a dead person. I'm just saying, like, to be like, well, I didn't want to choose, you know, I didn't want to deal with too many people, so I just chose this one specific person to respond to. And it's like, okay, the one specific person you're going to choose is not somebody who, for example, is alive and able to defend themselves and, like, uh, able to respond to it. You're going to be like, no, the one person I'm going to choose is this person who uh, died uh, incredibly prematurely and can't actually, you know, even engage in any sort of discourse. My battery was running low, so I just went for a quick cheeky cycle while I uh, waited for it to recharge. So I'm back now. She asserted that the company even having different uniforms for different genders in the first place was sexist. That's what I said. That's what I said. And that was the big issue at hand. She stated that by me moving from one uniform to another rather than challenging the greater policy, my actions were complicit in that sexism. Yeah, yeah, I would say that's a fair representation. And she expressed worry for my female co-workers who might have also been struggling with the same dress code. I mean, actually, no, I do want to say something else, which is actually, it's not just that. It's not just that you personally were only concerned about yourself. It's that you s subscribe to an ideology where the focus is not on overcoming the idea of uh, like gender depression, but rather deciding for yourself which gendered categories you fall into. That's the issue. Uh, obviously, if a woman's just going to kind of stick out, you know, like just try and protect herself against patriarchy, then obviously she's not standing up for all women, but it's kind of her prerogative. However, you went beyond that by literally subscribing to an ideology that in essence takes the focus away from the problem of uh, gendered expectations and puts the focus on which gender you belong to without actually challenging the expectations attached to belonging to that gender. Magdalene's video truly inspired me to think critically about all the gender dress codes that society has normalized for us. Okay, I mean, I'm not sure where this is going, but 
based on that right now, I'm just gonna tentatively say good. And that is exactly how radical content reels well-intended viewers in. in okay, but like that's the entire, that's the main substance of Magdalene Burns' objection, right? Magdalene's worry for my coworkers was a guy's. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a guy's. And again, it's very unsavory, like, calling somebody, like, I think this is, like, calling Magdalene Burns wrong is one thing, but calling her, like, disingenuous is, is really not nice when she's, you know, I mean, I'm not, look, again, I don't want to do the whole, like, you know, oh, as soon as somebody dies, you can't criticize them thing. But it's just like, if you're going to accuse somebody of being disingenuous and like, like the those kind of accusations, I think, it's just not fair to level them against somebody who isn't even around to defend themselves. Like, you're calling out the one person who you know who can't actually respond directly and call you out on um, how you're totally misrepresenting them. And that's just not cool. You see, in addition to exploring the sexist nature of gender segregated uniforms, her video also says I'm pathetic multiple times. We get that you didn't want to rock the boat. It's fucking pathetic. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, I will just say it's a personal judgment. That's not radical. Like, here's the thing. That's not a radical ideology. Somebody saying, well, look, if you just go along with patriarchy, of course, a radical, like the reality is that radical feminists, I mean, it's a lot like um, how a lot of kind of uh, radical kind of black liberation people are like quite <sighs> judgmental of kind of black people who just go along with it and just like, you know, kind of don't rock the boat. They, they, they get angry at them. And, you know, I don't really blame radical feminists for getting angry at women who, you know, kind of don't really try to properly attack patriarchy itself and just kind of try and forge their, their own way in it. But either way, even if I were to disagree with like this, I mean, obviously is an insult to call somebody uh, pathetic. So if I were to disagree with that personal insult, that's irrelevant to uh, Magdalene Burns' belief in ideology. That's not a radical belief for ideology. It's just a personal judgment. Ask yourself, ask yourself. As well as saying several other unkind things about me. This is an activist. Fuck off. Okay, so I, um, basically, uh, okay, I, I'm sorry, I, that wasn't a sentence. Basically, I was just reading the fourth thing as well, because it's now there. So, so far, the four things that have been mentioned, none of these are ideological things. Like, this is supposed to be showing how Magdalene Burns' ideology is radical, and people are being, like, sucked into Magdalene Burns' evil ideology. But actually... All this is, is like stuff Magdalene Burns said about you personally that you don't like, which I personally wouldn't like. I wouldn't do that if, if a um, like radical, sorry, a um, uh, trans identified person responded to me, I would keep like if I wanted to argue that they actually have this much worse, much more kind of objectionable ideology, I wouldn't mention anything they might personally have said about me because that's irrelevant to their ideology. And similarly, it's the case here, you know, um, Whatever Magdalene Burns said about you personally, that's not her ideology, is it? So you're miss... Well, yeah, you're just... You're not showing what you claim to be showing here. You're trying to show how actually there's this evil, radical ideology that people get sucked into. But all you're showing is that actually Magdalene Burns was maybe, you know, uh, a bit abrasive in your view. States that my true and secret motivation for switching uniforms is to gain access to physically comfier clothing. But why do you have to disclose a trans identity just to wear comfortable clothes? She's describing a very- um, Okay, the thing is, that's not even like, the point she's making there, Magdalene, is um, why everybody should be able to wear, wear comfortable clothes. And the issue is that by disclosing a transgender identity as the route to be able to wear clothes that make you more comfortable, you are implicitly saying that that is the way to get to where comfortable you're close. You can see the issue there, right? Claims that I calculatedly took the easy way out of a sexist policy. Okay, I'm just, I just need to, like, I'll interrupt here because it's just annoying me so much. Literally, again, I can't stress this enough. Your point was supposed to be that this is about how, um, like, gender critical ideas are radical and there's something objection about gender critical ideology that's radicalizing people by presenting reasonable concerns, but then actually having these very evil, uh, uh, like, radical concerns. 
And then all you're pointing out is that Magdalene Burns made specific criticisms of you as a person. Those aren't the same thing. Somebody can be a, like, even if I were to say Magdalene Burns was, I'm not going to say this, but even if I were, I mean, let's not even talk about Magdalene Burns, but it, I could say that somebody is the most horrible, mean, mean-spirited, uh, like, personally offensive person ever, but also say that ideologically all of their points are totally valid. So it's kind of, it's irrelevant, right? When you're a pathetic trans activist, you get thanked by your employers when you're actually... That's actually a really good point, though. Like, yeah, um, I don't think that you would get thanked by your employers for actually challenging their pretty substantial sexist policy. But if you're just willing to just go with the sexist policy and just be like, well, just personally put me in, in the right, um, uh, you know, sex uh, expectations, series of expectations attached to sex. Um, yeah, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's fine. We don't care about that. Uh, like the reality is, you know, that, yeah, you can't, when, when you engage with individualism, because I mean, ultimately neoliberal individualism is what allows these capitalist companies to even exist. When you just go along with that kind of mentality, of course, they're going to be thankful. They'd much rather you did that than say trying to collectively organize to overturn sexism in a more systemic way. I, I mean, I've already kind of probably responded to Magdalene Burns as, uh, or like looked at it because I did that thing where I watched like, I, I was supposed to watch every single one of Magdalene Burns' videos. I actually didn't end up watching all of them um, because I stopped after a while, which, you know, I'm probably just never going to return back to it. But I know that I did uh, watch this video and kind of gave my comments there. That's how pathetic she is. And all of this makes me wonder. So you'll notice how we literally got nothing about radicalization so far. Like the whole stated point of this video, like it literally says in the bottom there, theme one, radicalization, Magdalene, you haven't shown anything about radicalization. Let's continue. Why does Magdalene, acting in the interest of women, need to use my specific situation in order to point out the gender inequities in corporate uniform? She doesn't. She was responding to you because it was a response video. Well, maybe it's because she's not actually interested in the liberation of my co-workers, but more interested in discrediting non-binary identities and- No, 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 okay. Yeah, sure, maybe, but no, no. Um, Magdalene Burns is a radical feminist who is, or was, but you know, she lives on, um, is concerned about, yeah, I mean, radical feminism in general is concerned about overturning these sexist stereotypes. You, you, you look, I don't even I don't even care about this because it's like all you're doing is being like, well, maybe actually everything that she actually stood for, she didn't stand for. And it's like you okay, fine, but like that's just such a baseless accusation and an insulting accusation considering the circumstances. Um I don't want to entertain it. But like if you could actually give some kind of good argument beyond just saying, well maybe then then I would be slightly more impressed and bullying a trans person off the platform rather than challenging the system. Again, look, if, okay, I'm not, look, I don't, I don't personally really do much of the whole insulting thing, but I will say that I don't think anything Magdalene said was like that insulting, and I don't think that it should have bullied you off the platform. Systems she claims to be upset at, maybe she views this as an opportunity to direct blame towards trans people, concern troll, and fear monger. What she did wasn't even criticism, it was thinly veiled bigotry. But the problem is, when you disguise this kind of behavior as a progressive movement, it becomes particularly difficult to pick apart the reactionary elements from the very legitimate human ones. But well, what are the reactionary elements? You haven't actually mentioned any reactionary elements yet. Clearly, there is very little substantial feminist action behind the cruelty and misinformation directed towards trans folks by people like Magdalene. Now, after why is that clearly not the case? I just, I, I want more of an argument. Maybe at some point would be nice. Thank you. No one took her seriously, right? Wrong. People like Magdalene are often positively received and have real influence. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, look. At the end of the day, yes. Uh, of course. I mean, look, the like, I to be honest, you know, like I say, there's the whole, like, personally insulting you thing, but that's not really going to bother a lot of people who aren't you personally, right? And to be honest, you know, I am actually like, I, I do, per like, when I see somebody who I think is like a misogynist, I will often personally insult them. Uh, usually, I mean, I will insult them as misogynists. But yeah, I don't want to claim, like, I'm totally above some somewhat abrasive language. But, like, the reality is that, yeah, of course, most people who, uh, you know, engaged with Magdalene Burns' work, yes, did mostly focus on the actual 
point she was communicating, and you haven't criticized the point she was communicating. You've basically said in this video so far that you agreed with Magdalene's main point, you don't like that she insulted you personally, and now you're just arbitrarily asserting, uh, or you know, really kind of, I guess, more like speculating, that, hey, maybe she didn't actually care about any of the good stuff at all and just wanted to be mean to me. Which, I don't know why you would think that. That's a very strange thing to think. It's sort of a bit narcissistic. Narcissistic? Narcissistic. That um, just because somebody insults you, you assume that was the whole purpose of, what, their entire ideology? Are you... Are you okay? No. In her infamous essay, Turf Wars, Rowling wrote, Magdalene was an immensely brave young feminist and lesbian. But didn't she know that Magdalene insulted me? How dare somebody respect somebody who It's just ridiculous. Look, there's gonna be, like, I'm pretty sure there are even gender-critical feminists who have, like, personally insulted me. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, it definitely has happened, I'm sure it's happened. And, like, I wouldn't be so, like, self-obsessed as to be like, well, if somebody ever personally- I mean, I, I actually, yeah, I am aware of some uh, gender-critical feminists who have, like, kind of- I mean, for example, accused me of being disingenuous. That's an obvious example said I'm not really, you know, in favour of women or whatever else, um, in favour of women's rights. That's an obvious example. And to be honest, actually, most gender-critical feminists I know, I guess because they know me and know that I'm not disingenuous, um, have basically have issues with some of the other more high-profile gender-critical feminists. I say more high-profile. As far as I know, no super high-profile gender-critical feminists have, like, insulted me. But, like, people who have, let's say around maybe like a thousand followers on Twitter is kind of what I'm talking about. Anyway, point is like, I know that there's like, you know, I've seen different people take kind of different sides and usually most of the people who I actually know and like and get along with have always kind of taken my side. But the point is, let's suppose that there was a, um, uh, a high profile gender critical feminist who makes good content. And one day they make a video insulting me. And really, I mean like genuinely laying into me. I would maybe expect some people who like my content to disagree with, with that video, to think, hey, you shouldn't be laying into Michael, you shouldn't be insulting him, you shouldn't be attacking him, this is not a nice thing to do. But I would not expect them to just completely repudiate and reject everything she said. If they want to continue enjoying her content and liking her content and agreeing with what she said, that's fine. To be honest, I might even do it myself. You know, <laughs> like, I might be like, you know what, though, the rest of the points are still valid. Um, but even if I didn't, because I was, you know, personally hurt by these comments, it, you know, as I might have a right to be, it would be ridiculous for me to expect every single person to just completely base their opinion on this entire, like, person's channel and presence on whether or not they personally insulted me. I would think that was insane. But this is apparently what um, uh, Ash thinks is completely reasonable to expect. J.K. Rowling liked Magdalene Burns, but Magdalene Burns insulted me, and J.K. Rowling shouldn't have liked somebody who insulted me. Again, I will point out, you have not actually criticized Magdalene Burns' actual beliefs yet. You've only criticized her wording with reference to you and, you know, personal insults she leveled at you. As if, if her beliefs are actually correct, which I think they were, and you have an evidence that they aren't, why shouldn't people support Magdalene Burns and what she was saying and what her overall presence on this um, platform amounted to, which was not <laughs> limited entirely to insulting you personally. Fun fact, after I found that out, I had a panic dream that Magdalene and Rowling group DM'd me about what a disgrace I am to women. <laughs> I mean, look, Ash is smiling, so I can smile too, right? But that's just, I mean, I will say this, I have like panic dreams about like everything. Like I had a, um, I, I'm planning on going on a, a day trip somewhere relatively soon with my fiance, and I want to kind of document the day trip with my camera, like, you know, kind of like an actual proper vlog, just because I'm like, well, I, I record things with my camera, I'm going to this interesting place on a day trip, might as well record it. Actually, it's more of a city break, because it's going to last more than one day. But then, like, I literally, when I was kind of planning it out and kind of working out where we might go and all that kind of stuff, I had a dream that I went to Disneyland, uh, or somewhere kind of like Disneyland, it wasn't quite Disneyland, and I had my camera, and I was like holding my camera in a precarious way, and I dropped it. And and that was, I mean, you know, like genuinely I woke up, I was like, oh no, my camera, I, I dropped it, like I was, you know, I, it depends how much you want to say, like panic, but it was, uh, you know, it was definitely like a dream that was motivated by this thing that I knew I was going to have to do in the relatively near future, and I was like, oh, goodness me. Um, yeah, I've had like any, like quite minor significant events happening, have often motivated panic dreams for me.
But yeah, I'm just struggling to see what the point is supposed to be here. Like, J.K. Rowling liking Magdalene Burns caused you to have a panic dream. That doesn't... Whose fault is that? It's really nobody's fault, right? I mean, it's your brain that made that happen, but ultimately it's just a kind of, you know... Like, do you look for somebody to blame whenever you have, like, a nightmare or something? Are you okay? That was fun. Anyway, Meg's influence and positive reception probably has something to do with the fact that deep, 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 deep down, she makes some good points about sexism. So okay, I would like to point out again, you have not actually offered a single example of where her points are not good. Essentially, so far, I will remind everybody, your objection is... She makes some good points, or your, your overall assessment is, she makes some good points about sexism, but she insulted me personally. If I were to try to discredit a feminist based on those two things, I would be considered a raging narcissist. If I said that a feminist should be discredited because she makes some good points about sexism, but she insulted me personally, I hope that most of my viewers wouldn't take me seriously. I hope they would say, hold on a minute, whatever she said about you personally, that doesn't make her less of a feminist. It doesn't mean she shouldn't be taken seriously as a feminist. Apparently, what I think should rightly be described as raging narcissism is what you think should just be a perfectly reasonable reaction to something. Some feminists may feel that by rejecting the blatant transphobia in Magdalene's video, they are also rejecting the critique of sexist oppression. That no. I mean, it's more just that, like, Actually, the, the critique of sexist oppression is intertwined with the criticism of uh, transgender identity. The existence of trans people does not perpetuate sexism. Anyway, this kind of reaction... Uh, well, first of all, I would say the alleged existence of trans people. Um, but yeah, trans identity does perpetuate sexism by refusing to actually challenge sexism. But rather, again, just make the focus on, well, which of the, you know, which gendered categories should you fit into? Rather than challenging the idea of gendered categories. And it's much bigger than just some people making hateful YouTube videos. It can also be found in widely distributed books. Okay, I will point out, by the way, that so far both things, like, his, again, I don't want to just, like, be like, narcissism, 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 because it's getting a bit tiring at this point. But both things which are being criticized in the gender critical movement, I say things, I mean, obviously, this book and Magdalene Burns' YouTube channel are, uh, content that has directly called out Ash. So apparently this is all about Ash being very, very angry about people having called out the nonsense, um, which is okay. Well, I mean, it's not okay. Like it just, yeah, it just comes across as very kind of self-obsessed. Glitter nipples, glitter scars, beer bath. You know what? I feel like glitter scars. Is like the most perfectly I've ever seen two words sum up the modern trans identity movement. Like, <laughs> like that right there, just glitter scars. Um, that should be like, I don't know. I mean, like that honestly seems like it should be the title of like a book written by transgender trend or something. Um, like, I would, I would genuinely like purchase a book called like. Glitter scars, the uh, transing of uh, young women, or something like that. And I'd be like, yeah, that sounds like it would be a pretty accurate book. Um, so yeah, good, yeah, good, good book title there. Glitter scars. This is irreversible damage. The transgender craze seducing our daughters by. I just want to say I don't know if I'm going to actually pay too much attention to this, but I am going to see kind of what's said just to, you know. See if there is anything too interesting, but like I say, I haven't actually read the book, so if a claim's made like, the book says this, or uses this particular study or something like that, I'm probably not going to be able to be like, no it doesn't. Now if asked directly, my hunch is that Schreier would say she's not a TERF. Allegedly, she's not exclusionary of all trans people. Well, hold on a minute, also, she's not a radical feminist, she's, she's a conservative, right? Like, she's literally a conservative. So she's not a radical feminist, and that actually radical feminist disagree with Schreier on like literally feminism you know that thing that makes them you know radical feminists disagreeing with somebody on feminism itself might be a reason why uh she's not a radical feminist transgender adults are a different matter i refer to them by the names and pronouns they prefer wherever i can do so without causing con her pronouns are 
they, them. And Schreier goes on to refer to me as she for the entirety of the section. This is a clear indicator of how Schreier's proclaimed respect for trans adults is disingenuous. Well, hold on a minute. I would assume that Schreier probably thinks there's a difference between trans and non-binary, right? Like, I don't agree with Schreier um, because I, I, I probably won't include all of this. But basically, Schreier said that uh, basically if somebody is an adult, then Schreier will respect their trans identity and respect the pronouns that go along with that. But the thing is, I assume that when Shreya says trans, she means like a biological male claiming to be a woman or a biological female uh, claiming to be a man. Non-binary is potentially a different thing. It's entirely possible that Shreya is being perfectly consistent and just thinks that non-binary uh, identities are nonsense. And indeed, there's there are people who would probably genuinely fall into that category of thinking that yes, um, some transgender identities are valid, and indeed maybe all transgender identities are valid, uh, meaning trans going from man to woman, uh, but that non-binary identities, the idea that there is something in between man and woman is nonsense, that there is nothing between man and woman. Indeed, yeah, obviously the phrase like, there are only two genders, does not in and of itself contradict the fact that somebody could go from being one gender to a different gender. That's a possibility. And therefore, it's entirely possible someone could believe that there are only two genders, hence non-binary identities are invalid, but believe that somebody can switch between the two genders at their leisure. You are wrong in saying that she's necessarily being inconsistent or disingenuous. We watch her tell her mother for the first time that she's trans. Then why the heavy quotations? Trans. Also, what actual- I mean, again, it could be because, like, Shreya thinks trans is a valid thing, but that being non-binary shouldn't really be regarded as trans because non-binary is, like, something totally made up, whereas Shreya apparently, yes, thinks that some trans identities are valid, so maybe Shreya thinks that the term trans should only be reserved for trans identities she recognizes as valid or believes are valid, uh, and that therefore a non-binary person claiming to be trans isn't actually trans, it's illegitimate. Who wants to be, or thinks she is, is something in between. And yeah, this would be perfectly consistent with that. Uh, she, like, basically the idea is that, yeah, something in between is what uh, Shreya is objecting to. Shreya, again, thinks, as she stated at the beginning of the, of the book, that some trans identities are valid, but clearly thinks the idea of something in between is kind of nonsense. Um, and I mean, I'll point out, so I've actually already recorded, it's not going to be coming up until after this now, because, because, um, but basically Contra, I, I've recently responded to the Contra Points pronouns video, um, which, yeah, like I say, it's, it's recorded, but it will be up after this. Um, but having already responded to it, Contra makes a big point about how, like, the idea of um, kind of binary trans is quite different from non-binary trans, and indeed that for lots of people, the idea of binary trans might make a lot more sense than the idea of non-binary trans. Wants to be, thinks she is, something in between. Okay, well maybe Schreier just can't get behind non-binary identities. Uh, also, again, this is like another like kind of narcissist, like a lot of this is so far, in fact all of this, literally the only point made so far in this video, in this section on irreversible damage, and we are, what, uh, four minutes into it, out of like eight minutes in total, um, is on like Shreya's particular kind of regard and consideration for uh, uh, Ash's preferred pronouns. Like that's it. That's the only thing this has been about. The fact that Shreya has used the wrong pronouns. This is really not very impressive. Now I don't understand how, but if you are still not convinced that Schreier's work is reminiscent of turf sentiments, consider that the front of her book features an endorsement from Ray Blanchard, as if that's a fucking good thing. Well, it should be pointed out that Ray Blanchard is also not a turf. again taking turf as meaning a gender-critical radical feminist, so you should probably work on identifying who actually is gender-critical and a feminist. Moral of the story, for many radical ideologies like turfism, concern and intellectualism act as smoke and mirrors for bigotry. The but it is like, I mean, it is concern and it is, I mean, it's just, it's a meaningless sentence. Like, 
I feel like I should actually respond to that, but there's just nothing to say there. It's just completely like, well, they're not actually concerned. They're not actually intellectual. Well, well, actually, I guess it, that would be more convincing if any um, like uh, trans-identified person had ever kind of faced up against a gender-critical intellectual in any context, but that's never happened. I don't know. They were like thoughtful, published bigotry. They felt harder to dismiss than chud content and troll comments on YouTube anyway. However, well, obviously, like, yeah, you're not wrong to recognize that troll comments on YouTube are likely to not be like a very kind of accurate and serious representation of gender critical ideas, whereas actual gender critical ideas are much more credible and you haven't actually done a remotely good job. Again, you haven't actually done any good job at showing why any of the gender critical content you've engaged with in this video so far is wrong. You've just said it personally offends you. However, these masks of progressivism are just that masks. Why? Please show why. Why is it not actual progressivism? You haven't explained that. Still, these were the early seedlings that would later grow into my gaslit view that I was confused, regressive, and dangerous. I really struggle to believe that somebody who is this obviously like narcissistic and self-obsessed could also, and that's not an insult, by the way. Like, I know you're like, oh, you said you use personal insults. It's just an accurate assessment. Well, it's what I believe to be an accurate assessment based on what I've seen so far. And with that said, I struggle to believe that this person genuinely actually, like, went through a period of, like, incredible self-doubt uh, about gender identity or something like that. Um, that seems highly unlikely. Also, just an aside, the um, timeline is off with the actual chapters. Because anonymity makes attackers feel protected and thus empowered to speak viciously and unfiltered when addressing their targets. Speaking of unfiltered, if you are sensitive to abuse... Sorry, I should just say, uh, I just went into false mode. I'm kind of assuming a section on anonymity is unlikely to have anything worth responding to because I don't think it's going to be about, like, gender critical ideas. In fact, it's literally, you know, so theme one was about being gender critical and now we're on anonymity, but I will watch until the end because... I might as well watch the whole video, but I'm probably not going to have anything to say. Okay, so um, that's that's the end of the video. Um, again, I have no idea uh, how long it's going to end up being. I'm going to have to record like a part one, part two intro thing just to uh, make sure that I can account for the fact this might, video might end up being really long uh, because I kind of started running out of battery halfway through. My recording file is huge because I didn't stop recording the audio when I went to charge my camera because I'm cool. So I have no idea what's going to happen. This is going to be an absolute mess. A bit like the video I'm responding to. Anyway, I hope you did enjoy. Uh, I hope to, you know, you liked, subscribe, comment, uh, let me know what you thought. Uh, and also you can follow me on Twitter. You can check out Gilded. Uh, again, giving on Patreon really is appreciated. So if you do that, thank you so much. And I'll just say thank you to my current patrons. In addition to the names scrolling past on your screen right now, I would like to give a special thanks to last month's patrons Charlotte, Sambuca, and Skeptical. You're all very appreciated.